Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we'll be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone. Today, we are honored to be sitting down with the town of Georgina Councillor Dave Neeson. But before we get into today's interview, we want to remind municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast that we are always looking for more incredible guests like today's guest, Councillor Neeson. So if you're in elected office in any part of this country and have a passion for municipal politics, reach out today. Now, on to the show. Councillor Neeson, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with my basic question that I started off all my interviews, so you're no exception to this question. Where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? The famous question, right? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, probably to a certain degree, the same as you, Chris, in terms of journalism, right, is you want to do well by your community, you know, wherever it is you live and whatever context, obviously here in the context of Georgina, it's the local context, of course, is uh, is my passion. You know, others obviously get involved at provincial, federal level, or perhaps become public servant or, you know, journalism, whatever the case may be. But at the end of the day, I think the common thread between all of those professions and others, of course, is that you want to help people, right? Um, you want to, you know, you want to help shape the place you live or, uh, you know, the profession you're involved in or whether public servant, you know, et cetera. But, but at the end of the day, what it real, really boils down to is um, at its core is you want to, you want to help people. Right. You want to be helpful to your neighbors. You want to be helpful to your community, et cetera. Yeah. Was politics always a passion for Dave or did Dave ever think to himself, I'm going to be a politician one day and I'm going to be Ward 3 Councillor for the town of Georgina? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I mean, um, probably similar to yourself. I mean, I've always followed politics and being keenly interested. That's for sure. So, you know, I've always been a keen observer, but translating that to having the courage to get up and run. Um you know, I, that's not something I ever envisioned for myself. I was, um, I was very fortunate that, um, you know, always having being connected in here with my local community and others is that I was very connected with the, um, uh, you know, with the activities of my local council here, where I live, of course, in the town of Georgina, the best municipality in the country. I have to add in a plug there, but, but um, yeah, I mean, when the, uh, the local councillor in my ward in ward three <clears throat> retired back in, um, 2014, he had uh, sort of, you know, convinced me to put my name forward and thought that I would be a great advocate for the community. And, and so here I am, but it's not something I ever, ever sort of dreamed of. Um, in fact, I was skeptical. Um, you know, when the conversation was happening, I sort of thought, geez, really, um, you know, am I really the right person? You know, the things I think every, every candidate would probably go through, what's this going to look like? What will my family life be like? You know, what's the time commitment? What, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And so, um, and so, yeah, I totally unexpectedly, but I jumped in and I've been successful ever since, or at least I hope I've been successful and hope I've helped people along the way, which is the ultimate goal. Municipal politis- politics and especially municipal governance is often the forgotten level of governance. It's not the one that most people talk about. And I'm not trying to be rude there, but I think it's I think it's yeah. an honest statement there. Yeah. Did you know about municipal politics prior to that that councillor tapping you on the shoulder? You said you followed politics. I followed politics. My my aunt was the mayor of Scugog for some time, so I, I knew the area quite well, and I knew municipal governance quite well. I ran in 2010 myself. But going back, looking at my past, I don't think municipal politics was something that was discussed often around the dinner table. It was either federal or provincial. For you... Did you follow municipal governance and municipal politics prior to that tap on the shoulder in 2014? Yeah, for sure. So I can totally relate insofar as that, you know, most people tend to follow, you know, partisan politics or, you know, the six clock news, which is typically, you know, your main media outlets, which will cover, you know, your whatever province you're in. And of course, the federal government. And, um, you know, of course, then you apply your partisan lenses. So. Yeah, you're right. The municipalities tend to sort of, um, you know, fall out of the conversation there a little bit, especially as it relates to, you know, what the municipalities are responsible for, uh, you know, depending on your province where you live, but versus what your province's responsibility is and et cetera, et cetera. But um, but I was keenly aware. <clears throat> I'm fortunate in that regard in, in so far as that I recall, I think it was, um, I want to say it was in grade 10. I had a... Um, 
I had an assignment where I had to go to my uh, my local council chambers and do an assignment. And so I was fortunate at the time to meet the mayor, et cetera. And, you know, that was sort of a, an introduction as a young, interested um, young man at the time. But having said that, I, I also in my um, <clears throat> adult years, I've also been a public servant for a, an upper tier municipality uh, for now going on 20 years in the public health sector. And so, you know, I'm keenly aware, especially in uh, you know, as a public servant of sort of, you know, the municipal role in the upper or lower tier where, where I operate anyways, and, you know, the politics of it and, and you know, the way policy affects, um, you know, policy that's brought forward, how it affects on the ground level, you know, the the local town or city that you're involved in, right? So, so I've been really fortunate in that regard. It's certainly been a lot of work and you can see some of the, I don't know if you can really see it. There's a lot of gray hair here. It's not coming through really on the, on Zoom, but um but I've been fortunate, in addition to the the political sphere, to have a 20-year background in the municipal service. Yeah. So you put your name forward in 2014 to uh, be on council. You were ultimately elected. You're re-elected. And actually, I found this out. You were acclaimed in 2018, and then you were just recently re-elected in 2022. Now, you have been on council for coming up to almost nine years now. In October, you'll be nine years on council. Has the role of your job changed in those last nine years? Because we're seeing a lot of different things going on with municipalities, with downloadings from uh, from levels of government, with the role itself being more full time compared to even five, ten years ago. <laughs> you, 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 mm -hmm. you roll your eyes, but it's true. Yeah. It's a part time pay, but a full time job. What's been the biggest change that you've seen in the role of council, but also the role of the municipal government over the last nine years? Yeah, you're you're bang on for sure. I roll my eyes. You, you couldn't have said it any better. So I'm going to play second fiddle to you because that was a great intro. But um, you know, I think if um, I think if there was there was one thing that really changed things, it, it's probably um, countrywide really was you know the the COVID-19 pandemic um you know obviously being a, a member of elected government during that period of time you know of course as a lower tier counselor but you know I can imagine that that only escalates you know all the way to the top in terms of you know the the, the effect that it has but um you know that there was um it was difficult for everybody there's no doubt about it um you know, in the amount of questions and concerns and, you know, people struggling, et cetera, et cetera, um, you know, were very difficult. And it was very difficult, you know, within that context as well as to keep services flowing, which was critical to to people in the in the various communities and no different here in the town of Georgina. So, I mean, providing that as a as a, a broad overview, and of course, I think as a result of that too, and I think we were seeing it prior to, um, I would argue, probably even... Uh, countrywide is it you know there's also some level of of social interaction that we see changing you know throughout our society in general you know whether it's the you know the rise of social media moving away from traditional media into other types of media sources or you know the way in which some of those um you know the way in, in which some of those platforms work and and feed people what they want to see that sort of thing but at the end of the day um you know, I think that's really created that there's a lot more communication that I receive now. Now, bearing in mind, there's probably some level of, well, you're nine years in versus, you know, new as well. But yeah, um, I always say you got to be careful as a as a politician, because the more popular the get you get, the, the busier you're going to become. And, you know, people in your community are going to really rely upon you. But but, you know, that I think that social dynamic is changing. You know, interpersonal group dynamics are changing. Interpersonal communications are changing between people. Um you know, so that level of communication is, as you say, can be hard to keep up with at times. And of course, as you as you hear from everybody, I think, you know, no matter again what province you're in, is that municipal government's the closest to the people. It's the most accessible. You know, um, you know, you're likely not going to speak to your local MPP on the phone or your local MP, you know. And as they move through the ranks, if they're in government or they're a cabinet minister, you know, you're likely going to speak to their staff. But but that's not the case here, at least where I live in the town of Georgina. Um, you know, it's not the city of Toronto. So people have my cell phone, they're going to call me. So so all of those things combined are, you know, can be a real challenge. It's very different, um, you know, from where we were at, let's say, nine years ago. And the attitudes are different and the level of engagement is different as well. And that also includes sort of, um, you know, emotions. People are very emotionally invested in in, in politics generally, whether it's, 
you know, in a partisan sense or whether it's because there's somebody in need, et cetera. But, um, but for sure, the, the service level is, you know, if anything has gone through the roof or the service demands. For- Either you've listened to the show numerous times or you know exactly what I'm about to ask you. Either way, you have just set up the perfect segue into a lot of my future questions here, Dave. I want okay. to talk about I want to talk about engagement. I have been a big proponent that municipal government is probably the one that people don't care most about. They, as long as the garbage is picked up and their water's turned on, they're happy. And I'm not being rude there. I just think that's truly what it is. Unless there's a big controversial issue, they, the average resident or citizen probably just doesn't deal with their municipal government on a day-to-day basis. Have you yeah. seen that change? And how do you battle back against that? Because your role as a counselor is to make decisions based on what you hear from the public. But if the public is not giving you the information that you potentially are looking for, whether it be public open houses, going out to the local events and just talking to your neighbors, you're not going to be able to make a pretty informed decision. I believe that you're probably uh, engaged as much because you don't get elected twice. You don't run uh, uh, unopposed uh, once by not being good at your job. So how do you ensure that there's engagement going on? And have you seen it change over the last nine years compared to when you first started to 2023? Yeah. So um, I guess to break it down in two pieces is, yeah, I mean, over the nine year, nine year period, I think things have, um, you know, I think there's always a natural involvement, you know, of any, any service or company, you know, at some level, and, you know, typically it'll demand on their, their clients expectations. So in our case, of course, you know, the constituents were responsible for, um, you know, and I think um, really over the nine year period, when we talk about sort of, you know, transparency, accountability, uh, public consultation, et cetera, et cetera, is that at least what I've found is that, you know, I don't think the expectation is any different. Um, I don't think it's any different necessarily between nine years now or nine years previous to now. But I think what we're delivering is a little bit different. And I think that communities are tend- tending across the country and certainly um, here where I am anyway, is the expectation is sort of has gone up, right? We spoke about, you know, the, the um, you know, the rise of social media as an example, you know, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. There's all these sort of modalities that, you know, didn't exist or if they existed, you know, weren't re- very widely used, um, you know, to a certain degree, you know, 10, 15 years ago, et cetera. So there's much more modalities that you can use you know, as opposed to, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it was probably sort of, um, you know, your kitchen table discussions, you know, you pop into a constituent's place, you you sit around the dinner table, that sort of thing. Um, You know, even with our own families, even though some of our families, you know, are probably still, listen, no, no politics at the dinner table. But, you know, so I think with that comes a comes a a certain expectation. I think the expectation is fair is that um, you're right when you say to go back to the start, you know, as long as everything is operating smoothly, you know, the water's running, the water's clean, the garbage is getting picked up, you know, the the roads are being appropriately taken care of is another big one, you know, or maintained, especially here in uh, in Canada, when we talk about a winter maintenance program, you know, you, you got to plow the roads and, and that sort of thing. But, um, you know, but I think um, with that extra communication and accountability, you know, and all those extra modalities also drives, you um, drives interest and questions and concerns and and rightfully so and so at some level we're uh you know um you know we're a product of our own success meaning that the more we communicate out and we find these other ways you know whether it's canvassing canvassing outside elections sending out an electronic newsletter uh you know uh, uh putting hard copy newsletters out posting updates on various social media channels what you know whatever um people use i don't want to uh, I'm probably going to miss some, so maybe I shouldn't name any. There's all sorts nowadays. So, you know, with that comes obvious question and engagement, all of which is a good thing. Um, you know, and I think, again, that's really, really changed. Um, so how does engagement come into play for you when, in 2018, it's a an odd election for you because you are a claim. So you run on a post. So ultimately, you believe you're doing a great job. But in 28, yeah. 2022 and 2014, you run a post. People do put their name forward and say, okay, I believe I could do a better job than Dave. So you yeah. know that not 100% of the people voted for you. And I think that unless you don't look at the results the day after the election, you know that. Yeah. How do you engage with people who 
don't feel like they have a voice in in this council or don't feel like what you're doing is the right way to move forward because you're there elected by the people but elected to serve everyone and then on the bigger scale you're elected at, at the ward three level but you're there to serve the, all the people of georgina so how do you ensure and your role as counselor ensure that you're engaging with not just people in the same eco chamber as you but everyone, uh, even the ones who don't agree with you, because I think there's there's a big issue federally and provincially right now where we're not seeing that happen. And municipally, I think it's still the safe haven where people will engage with everyone. Yeah, for sure. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, yeah, because you're right. It's very different than a, a partisan environment, as an example. But um, well, I mean, I give you a couple of real life examples that in because um, you're quite right, I was unopposed in um in 2018, but I still took the time. Now, I'll be completely transparent. I didn't hit every single door within Word 3, but I did take the time to go out and, you know, I'm throwing in a rough percentage here, you know, probably 70% of the doors. Um, even though I had already been acclaimed, you know, the deadline had passed, we, you know, it was very clear where things landed, but I still wanted to get that sense for the reasons that you that you had outlined is what I don't want to be is in an echo chamber. Um, and I think it's one thing I've learned after nine years is that <clears throat> it's very easy for that to happen. And, you know, I'm constantly having to check myself against that too. Right. Um, and make sure, you know, I think it's very easy for that to happen. And so, you know, moving forward, or at least, um, you know, my current practice in terms of people that are, um, you know, let's face it, you know, all politicians or elected officials, let's say, you know, have their detractors, people that, you know, they just don't like them. They, they you know, don't believe they're represented, their views aren't represented, et cetera, et cetera. And so what I do, um, or at least I try to do, generally speaking, is seek some of those people out and have, you know, go back to the, the dinner table discussions, right? And have yeah. real and honest, open, honest debates with people. You know, I've always, one thing I've learned this may not be popular, but I think it's it's the truth is that you have to learn to say no sometimes and have an opposing view. Uh, but also, um, you have to be open to hearing the other person's side, but both parties have to sort of, you know, try and work together. I find most people tend to be reasonable. Um, Does it come down to respect? I, I'll be honest with you. I think so. I think so for sure. Um, yeah. You know, again, though, I think that, you know, to a certain degree that's changed and the, the mood I think within society is also different. Um, you know, post COVID, I mean, we see what happens online and we see the spread of misinf misinformation and, you know, other political theories moving into populism, et cetera. But, and so I think that makes it much more challenging, but what I, what, what I try not to do is shut out the other side completely, as long as to your point, as long as there's respect and we can maintain all that, you know, I have had to cut conversations off in the past, but I, you know, I always try to sort of be reasonable about it, um, you know, as long as we're not talking about, you know, somebody threatening violence or something like that, you know, I always try to say, listen, let's, you know, I'm listening to you. I'm here to listen to you, you know, use your active listening skills. Don't interrupt people. Try and get to the root of what their issue is, you know, repeat what their concerns are, et cetera. And I find most times you can tend to come to a middle ground, but um, yeah, those are, that's typically my strategy to be honest with you. And I do find it helpful. Um, and some of the times, even if you, um, hearing from those with an opposing view what i can find is even if you disagree with what they're saying specifically sometimes there's themes you can take away or you can understand by again with active listening skills understand where they're coming from um you know which can sometimes be helpful and you know we all need to be mindful of that when we're representing you know large constituencies like myself you go into that council chamber on a weekly if not monthly basis uh, depending on what time of the month it is or what time of the year it is and you have to make some pretty big decisions. And now you've been at this for nine years and the decision, decisions are not getting easier as time goes on. The cost of living is going up. Things are getting harder for a lot more people. How much weight and responsibility do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers to be prepared, to be informed, to be engaged, but not cemented in the idea of how you're going to vote because you have to make decisions on the fly by what you hear at council chambers, by what you hear from your fellow councillors. And sometimes the way you go in might not be the way you vote. So how important is it for you to be prepared, but not cemented in the idea of how you're going to vote every time you walk in? Yeah, I think it's critical. Um, you know, I always talk about the process and, you know, the process matters in that regard as far as, yeah. 
<clears throat> like you said, that the biggest thing I've always found is being prepared, knowing the subject matter, reading the subject matter. Yes, it can be challenging. You know, um, you know, Chris, you, you're more than aware. Some agendas can be, you know, 700 pages, 500 pages. You got a week uh, to figure it out. So, but you got well, you have a the, week. Sometimes some counselors only have three days. They get it Friday. They have to be prepared for Tuesday. <laughs> Yeah, and it can happen. You know, sometimes, um, at least in our context, sometimes things can come on a on a on an addendum, right? You don't know, but um, but uh, you know, it's critical to read all those things and understand them, and also have the conversations, you know, with the authors of the report and sometimes their superiors to really ask questions and really understand, but also keep your mind open to what the needs of others are when they're representing the needs within their communities. You know, um, as an example, you know, you're aware of being from over in Scugog is that Georgina is a pretty big place and it's very diverse. You know, it's got its, you know, quasi urban areas. It's got its agricultural areas, it's open spaces, you know, um, you know, and so with that comes some very diverse views. And so you have to be open to the, you know, to the, to the perspective of, as an example, I'm the word three counselor. I have a mix of all, you know, but uh, you know, a counselor who, you know, I don't know, um, maybe in a different ward may have a different, completely different perspective from their constituencies because they see things differently or they have different wants and needs or expectations. And so, um, you know, I find the art, which uh, you've probably heard and you know for sure, is that not only do you have to be, uh, you know, have an open mind about it, um, about going in there and not necessarily having a, a predisposed position on something, but you have to be open to also hearing from the public, as you know deputants are going to come in and they may provide you with a fresh question you'd think geez it's not something i thought of let's let's keep an open mind and hear from staff or whatever the case may be but but just you know from your colleagues alone recognizing you know they've been given the um the honor of representing the citizens that they represent is that they may have a different perspective and so um you know and so that's something that i'm always keenly aware of especially in some of our diverse areas is that you know what are people in the south feeling what are people in the northeast feeling and you know and they're they're you know those constituents their their voices matter just as much as the ones that i represent and so even though we may have you know different ways of going about things or whatever is that you know they all have to be you know feel included and so sometimes that means like you said keeping an open mind when you walk in the door is it hard to balance the needs of the community versus the needs of the residents like when you get issues that are put forward to you and sometimes the budget may not fall that ward three is going to get all the funding that they request but you have to look at the budget as a whole is it hard to sit there and look at the budget and go okay i i don't see as much as i want in this for ward three but for georgina as a whole moving forward it's going to make the community a better place for everyone yeah, for sure. It's not something that um, I don't think it's any it's it's something that people would necessarily want to admit or get too in depth in. But I will, you know, it's something I'm keenly aware of. You know, I'll, I'll give a few examples, you know, especially during the uh, 2018 term, there was in, in those particular budgets and recognizing, of course, that, you know, 2020, we were going into global pandemic. And so, um, you know, adding things at that period of time, of course, was was something that um, you know, you really had to, had to have a critical eye on um, because of the the economics that we were in, notwithstanding the the, the public health situation. But but you know, I didn't ask for a whole lot, and it's not because I didn't want things for my local community. As an example, you know, um, I've got a I've got two like uh, very big waterfront parks. We would call Class A waterfront parks, which are extremely large. They're a driver of tourism. They're um, you know they're they're heavily used by local residents you know and they're they're large waterfront areas both of them require very serious investment we know this that this is not something that's new um you know and so i would have loved to put forward you know something on the spot or negotiated a few months before you know but look this is going to be millions of dollars and this is why i think that you know ward three you know deserves some level of priority over something else but what i also recognize is that pitting one against the other yeah you know Ward one against Ward three, Ward two against Ward three, Ward five against you know whatever the number is, you know, and pitting that against the the needs of of my local residents <clears throat> is not the way to do it because in my mind all that does is drive drive wedges and conflicts not only on council but against you know neighbors. Just imagine if you're living on opposite sides of the street or something like that. One's in Ward two, one's in Ward three. So I don't find it helpful. But what I 
what I do do is try and look at things, as you say, from a whole of a community perspective and say, geez, yeah, so I've got a, a tough position over here, but the needs in this particular ward, even though it's a large budget item, you know, there's an issue of equity, you know, for that community. And so even though, you know, their asset not um, may not be as worn out as the asset here in Ward 3, we got to have the conversation about equity. You know, there's social determinants that need to, social determinants of health even, that may need to be brought into the fold. You know, they may have le less access to transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and so I try to take that whole community approach, um, but I'm also... You know, I also enjoy those conversations, not only with our staff, my constituents and, you know, my fellow members of council is that, you know, I'm always quick to say, listen, you know, um, for all of these reasons, I agree. And this is why this budget needs to provide for priority to, you know, this ward that's not, you know, ward three or something like that. And I'm always quick to say, but listen, you know, at some point here, I'm going to have these large sort of ass. And so I'm going to play ball. But at the same time, you know, you got to recognize that the constituents here in Word 3, you know, they've got wants and needs too. And so the needs have to be met. And so, you know, we're going to have to come together based upon those needs at some point, you know. And so where I'm at now in terms of, you know, fast forward that discussion to today is that, you know, pretty soon there's going to be some large capital requests that come through in my ward. And so, you know, a lot of that work that you undertake, you know, to make sure we have a, a you know, a wholesome community and you do things with a whole community approach rather than, um, you know, pitting one community against the other, um, you know, I think we're really going to see that pay off. I, I just looked at the time and I just realized we're almost at the half hour mark and I haven't even turned to segment two. So I'm going to do that right now, if that's okay with you. I want to I, I want to preface this segment by saying this. This is a conversation between the counselor and myself. This is not a motion of counsel. This is not a direction of counsel. This is the counselor's opinion talking to the host of the cross-border interviews. That being said, the question is, in your opinion, counselor, what is the biggest issue as of recording this interview facing the town of Georgina today? Um, I could give you a top three and I'm give me the top it, three then. Give you the top three. Okay. Well, I mean, as we know, we're in the province of Ontario. We all know the um the affordability crisis we all find ourselves in. And of course, the the housing shortages, you know, across the country, you know, not unique to Ontario, but certainly here being in Ontario in the, the southern uh, GTA is, of course, we have growth pressures. You know, we can't avoid that conversation now. Um, and never mind the political backdrop of what's going on in the province of Ontario, kind of an interesting last uh, couple of weeks. But regardless, is that we've got very serious growth pressures. We know that no different than anybody else. We're not unique in that regard. Um, and with that comes infrastructure, um, infrastructure problems that we have in terms of, uh, you know, something very concrete is our water and wastewater capacity. They're not where we need them to be. And so if the province wants to come in and say, well, you need to grow and here's your target and you need to build all this. Well, that's all great. Um, but we don't have the water and wastewater infrastructure. So can we have a conversation about that? Right. It's not to throw a, a stick in the spokes, but one can't go without the other. And so. You know, there's a bit of a breakdown, but either way, our, our infrastructure, especially on the water and wastewater, um, you know, we have serious capacity issues that need to be solved. And of course, that's going to mean long term planning and it's going to need capital financing. And so uh, there's that. And of course, it goes hand in hand with that is the uh, is, you know, the affordability crisis the the, the two are almost synonymous. And so. Um, yeah, we're no different than anybody else. Um, you know, this community, at least we're the, we're the most northernmost in York region. But having said that, you know, I don't know, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars is probably less than other communities, but that's not affordable in my mind. You know, I don't know who's, who's able to buy these as a first time home, home buyer. But, you know, I think there's a lot of people being shut out of the market. And even though we can claim that we're better off than other uh, communities in New York region again we go but that's just a wedge and you know but it, it's not solving anything um you know and so well it's not something that we can necessarily deal with or we can't deal with you know as strictly a lower tier government basis but you know we got to find a way to get all the parties together you know um to become involved in this whether it's the infrastructure you know etc cetera, etc cetera. um managing the we spoke sort of um about managing expectations, that's always a challenge going forward, especially, again, we're the northernmost um, community here in York Region, and we're very proud to be from York Region, but at the same time, there's a lot of pressure that comes as a result when we have a lot of people, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, moving out of the, uh, you know, the southern areas of York Region, moving into the northern 
uh, areas here in the town for obvious reasons, like Simcoe, quality of life, all of those sorts of things, recreational opportunities. Uh, I mean, who doesn't want to live on Lake Simcoe and be, you know, I don't know, um, you know, 30, 40 minutes from the southern parts of the GTA. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the expectations that come with that, you know, in terms of the service delivery models you'll see in the Richmond Hill, Markham's, Vaughn's, you know, it's a little bit different. We don't have that type of tax base to draw on. So, you know, you have to manage those expectations as well. Um, and so that's challenging. And lastly, no different than anyone else. I'm sure you hear all the time. Um, we're making some really good strides. But, um, you know, the commercial investment side and the economic development, you know, um, we can't continue to to sort of um continuing the way that we have been for a very long period of time is gathering all of the uh, the tax base from the residential taxpayer not being being able to um offset that with ICI growth or industrial commercial assessment and so we're uh never mind the 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 obvious social benefits that come with that job creation local jobs etc but um you know those things have all been challenging I'm proud to say on the um on the growing our tax base, we're making some real strides that are um, quite demonstrable right now, which is really good. But either way, those are all things that we need to continue to work on. They're all serious challenges. I'm going to ask the million dollar question here because I think it's the, probably the most important question I probably will have asked during this interview with that last statement. Um, infrastructure funding, affordable housing, affordability in general, this is not a municipal only issue. This is a municipal, provincial, and federal issue that all need to come to the table. While we know that the provincial, and this is Chris Brown saying this, is not the councillor saying this, while we know the provincial and federal government does not move at the same pace as municipal governments, municipal governments are being left holding the bag and trying to come up with solutions for these issues in the short term until the federal government and the provincial governments get up to uh, speed with them. What's the town of Georgina doing right now to sort of alleviate some of these issues? You talk about the economic business coming to the community, but that's great. But housing is also another issue that is front and center. You've just said infrastructure. You can't raise your tax base 15% next year because that's career suicide for anyone who does it. How do you do that? How do you solve these issues? And I, and I say you in the royal you, like how do you as a council come together and try to solve these issues while working with your upper tier regional partnerships as well? Yeah, well, quite <laughs> rightly so. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it lies also with the region. So there's a lot of collaboration there. And of course, you know, here locally, we have um, we have two seats on regional council, of course, we got the mayor and the regional councillor. And, uh, and so they, they sit at those tables that, of course, interact on a symbiotic basis with, you know, our, our local so social service agencies, uh, you know, uh, HYI or Housing New York Inc., which is our local, um, you know, subsidized housing agency, etc. You know, public health, of course, you know, there's a you know, there's a, there's a, there's an opioid crisis that we're also not, we're not immune to, let's face it. Um, you know, that, in the, of course, then there's, there's mental health issues, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, you know, those are things that we interact very closely with, with York region, of course, as we should. And as I mentioned, we've got two members of government that, that sit there on our council. And so, you know, I think we have a, we have a very good relationship there. We've got some local public health services that have come into our community. Um, you know, we, as an example, we have a, well, I think we were the first community hub, or at least we were the first community hub in York region. And I believe we were first one or two in the province of Ontario going back to uh, 2014, we opened the doors. And so, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of collaboration, quite frankly, with it. We paid all the money, we upfronted it all, we did all the capital, etc. You know, that houses our food bank, social service agencies, the chamber, you know, there's all sorts of um there's all sorts of people that public health is there with their uh, seniors dentistry program, et cetera. We've got social services in there, um, you know, but when you say in terms of the affordability crisis, quite rightly so, it's not something that Georgina can solve on its own, but we need to get, for some reason, there seems to be a real disconnect between our relationship with the region of York, work very closely, work very well together, deliver frontline services, there's bricks and mortar. And there's, you know, there's, there's obvious benefits that are measurable that come with that to the community. But moving now to the provincial side, and I don't mean this in a, in a partisan way at all, but, you know, moving to the province, there's not that level of integration um, or collaboration, just period, even with the decision makers. As a prime example, I was at, I was at the Association of Municipalities uh, of Ontario 
what was it last week i believe in london i want to say anyways days are getting away from me here but you know and here we are getting dictated to housing numbers no consultation no political uh you know political uh, discussion you know no staff to staff discussion you know and so these things just don't work um you know and so there's not much different to be quite honest with you with the federal government you know these sort of edicts come down and you know, you're going to do X, Y, or Z, you know, the accelerator fund as an example. But there's very little discussion or integration with those things. And so I think what you see on behalf of, you know, the constituents, at least that I represent, is that becomes very, very obvious to people. Um, you know, again, it's, it's just a, a boots on the ground observation, which I think is tangible and easy. Is look, we have York Region offices in the town of Georgina, some of which in our in our town owned buildings, you know, there's there's collaboration and all of those things, but you don't see that with the provinces and the feds. And so, you know, we go back to the municipalities to the front line and the closest to the constituents. And, um, you know, there could be all sorts of reasons for that. I'm not a political science degree person, but uh, so I'll leave that to smarter people than I am. But but um, but you don't see that level of integration with the province or the fed. Um, with the municipality or amongst the two of them either and so i think it's no wonder we're we're sort of left with all these patchwork solutions and the, the municipality seems to always be the person at the bottom of that line because it's the you know it's the smallest level of government and only really exists because the province says so but um you know there's really there's a lot of downstream effects there i was going to ask a follow-up question to this but you just said something i need to follow up on because <laughs> you're right collaboration is key collaboration is huge when it comes to federal provincial and even regional and um a first level first tier government but i'm going to battle back a, a, a little bit against you on that the resident sure. doesn't care the resident does not care if it's a federal issue or provincial issue or municipal issue if they come yeah. to you they talk to you and you you're shit you're nodding your head and you I, i'm yeah. assuming you agree with this because yeah. they want the, they want you to do this. They don't want to see it play out on the news. They don't want to see it play out on social media. They just want things fixed because they're hurting right now. How do you battle? How do you collaborate with people who don't want to collaborate while trying to make it look like you're doing something when other levels of government don't want to? Yeah, that's a good question. I agree with you completely. And quite rightly so. That's that's the expectation of well, of anyone, and quite frankly, it should be, is that, look, I've got this problem and I, I'm I'm looking for a solution. Who cares where the solution comes from? But, you know, I need the solution. You know, so I think a lot of that boils down, to be honest with you, and it's impossible, you know, to, to navigate absolutely everything. But just, you know, to sort of, to bring it to, a, to something tangible, I'll give an example. I've got a constituent, um, I have quite a few constituents that have all sorts of health concern issues, you know, mobility issues, et cetera. They need PSW services to get out of bed, et cetera. There's lots of people in communities across Canada like that. So of course, here in the province of Ontario, that's a, it's a provincial issue. Now they'll come to me. Why? Well, they can get a hold of me and they know Dave and Dave will come by the house. We'll sit at the, you know, we'll sit around the, the dinner table, we'll have a conversation. And so some of it's relationships, right? Is that I can go to our local MPP's office you know, get them to make inquiries, et cetera, you know, very quick and ensure there's coordination between communication, you know, and even though it's not within my realm of responsibility, you know, I want this done for the individual and it's, it's a reasonable expectation that they should have these sorts of services. So, um, you know, there's some of that, but of course, recognizing that that's not possible across ministries throughout the province and the, the federal government, um, you know, and again, quite rightly so. People have individuals, they, they individuals have issues they bring forward and they want them solved. They don't care about who's paying for it or whose jurisdiction it is or, or any of those sorts of things. And so I'll be honest with you, that's always a major struggle struggle when you're the most accessible to the community. Um, How often are you dealing with uh, provincial and federal issues as a local councillor? Uh, quite a bit, to be honest with you. Definitely like more. More after COVID or more like the same uh, pre post COVID? Um, good question. I'd say, I would say for sure more on the provincial side and on a generalized basis, definitely more on the provincial side, um, than federal. But having said that, you know, we all hear, you know, we all hear some of the federal, um, type issues, of course, you know, interest rates, et cetera. Now, not necessarily federal government, Bank of Canada, but, you know, generally speaking, more of a federal issue, but, um, okay. you know, I tend to hear a lot more on the provincial side, healthcare. It's always top of mind, always, you know, and here in Northern GTA, 
northern New York region, we have challenges with it. Um, that that's an obvious one. Yeah. Um, you Education, know, of course, I'm assuming you yeah. got <laughs> education is always number two. You know, it's back to school. So guess what? Dave's emails filling up with right. Yeah. Back to school right. issues. You know, the fence is up. The fence is not open on the pathway or whatever the case may be. Right. Uh, the school bus is not going to be servicing my area. You know, whatever the case may be. Right. So yeah. I, I am cautious of time and I want to turn to my last subject. And it's my favorite subject because I enjoy tourism. I enjoy visiting communities. And I believe as a big proponent of tourism, we should be spending our economic dollars here in Canada visiting these great communities that we have. I think we are untapping, we're not tapping into the municipal tourism sector as much as we should be. And I am a strong proponent of doing that. And as someone who just got done a cross country tour through Ontario, all the way oh. to Quebec, <laughs> all the way through Manitoba, Saskatchewan, I was able to get through york region but i did not get up to georgina so it's on my bucket list for next cool. year when i do another big giant road trip so dave in your opinion what mm -hmm. should tourists do in georgina if they find themselves up that way in the gta in the york, york region well i mean the obvious for sure and by the way you have a you have a personal invite anytime you want we'd be more than happy to have you and we'll give you a full tour of the assets that we have i think you'd be quite impressed probably from what you're used to in the younger years, but um, we've come a long way. But um, the the most obvious, you know, uh, I sound like a broken record all the time, you know, promoting the town and whatever show I'm on, but it's it's not even about me. It's just, it's the obvious. It's Lake Simcoe. There's no doubt about it. You know, um, any one of our constituents would tell you the same thing. Lake Simcoe is um, is the prime jewel of, of Georgina and Northern New York region. And so when we talk about tourism, you know, nine times out of 10, that's what you're going to want to hear, right? Is, you know, uh, you know, it doesn't matter you typically where people are from, but uh, if they're going to visit the area, they're going to go to a waterfront park. You know, they may go to the provincial park, Sybil's Point, perhaps. They may visit one of ours. It depends if they're looking for overnight stays or not. But um, that's typically what you'll find. Uh, is you know they want to go they want to go to the beach and they want to enjoy their time in Lake Simcoe whether you know whether it's recreationally you know maybe it's kayaking maybe it's boating uh, you know whatever the case may be and then you know as a subsidiary I guess the um, one thing we always have to consider is that you know there's 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 economic development offshoots that come from that right where are they going to get their food what local what good local restaurants are there you know, is there any cultural opportunities? You know, as an example, we have the Stephen Leacock Theater with the Queensville Players are one of the greatest tenants, you know, and production people that that operate out of there. Um, you know, so so for sure, you got to start with Lake Simcoe. And then we go from there, you know, whether it's into our downtown areas, you know, which um, we're working on some re revitalization strategies, quite rightly so. Um, and then they all work hand in hand. They all do, but it all, it always comes back to Lake Simcoe. And that's why you always hear, I'm going to go off topic for a second. You'll always hear me talk about its protection because it's the cornerstone of what's important to this community and all of the watershed communities, I believe, for sure. So after a long day of council meetings, after a long day of work, where do you go in the town to decompress? Where And no, you can't say your own house for every <laughs> other councillor who says that to me. Uh -huh. Where do you go in the community to just let it all go and just reconnect with yourself, whether it be a restaurant, whether it be a bar, whether it be a park? Where's Dave's sort of center spot? I'll be honest with you again, it's Lake Simcoe. I'm fortunate here that I have a, a road end association beach <clears throat> where I live. And so I'm extremely fortunate and I don't, uh, I don't ever forget that. Now I don't live waterfront, but having said that I have access to waterfront. And so that's quite the privilege. Um, a lot of people don't have, and you know, I don't forget it. And I love to, to introduce people to it as well and give them opportunity. Um, you know, but that's where I, I really get to reset, you know, um, I'll just simply walk down, you know, it doesn't for me, you know, I love the winter, you know, um, so that's, that's never a concern for me. But whether it's the winter and go sit on the ice, literally, we of course, when it's safe, um, you know, or whether it's sitting at the picnic table just on the shores of Lake Simcoe, you know, and just contemplating and thinking, you know, that's really the place where I get, you know, my rest, my relaxation. But moreover, as I can center myself and really, really think critically about the decisions, the impact in the long term, you know, and what people are um We'll go right back to the beginning. How best do I help people? What is it they're looking for? How do we improve the quality of life? How do I help this individual with their, you know, with a problem, whatever the case may be, but, but that's the way, that's the way I do things. So sitting there for a sunset or even watching the sun come up, the best way to do it. So 
the last question for you, Dave, and it's probably the easiest question you'll probably ever get on a show like this, but I'm going to ask it because I think it's the most important. What okay. makes Georgina the, uh, a, sorry, what makes Georgina such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Well, I'm going to be a broken record, Chris. <laughs> so, number one, Lake Simcoe, you know, it's uh, sometimes referred to as the Little Great Lake. Um, you know, it's not a great lake, but it's the largest lake outside of the Great Lakes in the province. And so, you know, we're extremely fortunate um, with that. And of course, you know, I could go on forever, but we all know the benefits that come all, come from lakeside living. And of course, the challenges too, but whether it's a recreational opportunity, getting to go and sit by the lake, recenter yourself, etc. Um, you know, wh whatever the case may be, it's the top has got to be Lake Simcoe. But what's also, what's also really cool, if I could use that term. Uh, am I young enough to still say that? I don't know, but I, but I don't know how old you are, but I feel old, man. As you said, you're gray haired. I'm like, I have gray hair. Yeah. Right? You... <laughs> well, I got a haircut yesterday, so I told her to cut it all out. So it's looking a little better, but, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, we're a diverse community and we're a growing community. We're a diverse community, but you know, whether it's Lake Simcoe and that's your interest, you know, I want to go, I don't know, jet skiing, boating, swimming, paddleboard, paddle you know, whatever, whatever that looks like, or maybe it's just sitting on the lake and reflecting, I don't know. But, you know, so whether it's that or whether it's, you know, I want to go, you know, from a cultural perspective, we have an art gallery, we have the Stephen Leacock and, you know, cultures or thing, that's fine. Um, you know, so, and those are our downtown areas. So, and we have lots of that in terms of, you know, shopping, et cetera. And we've got some really cool local small business. People like that sort of stuff, whether it's artisans, that kind of thing. Um, so we've got our, our, our we got the lake, we've got our urban, our downtown areas. But if agritourism is your thing as well, then, you know, I don't know, um, you know, you want to go shop for local healthy food, you know, that's, I don't know, 45 minutes from your house, 40 minutes, whatever the case may be. I want to see, um, you know, livestock, see how they're raised, evaluate the farm and and buy local product, produce here, or, you know, whether it's, um, uh, vegetables as well whatever whatever your thing is we we can offer an awful lot of that so whether it's open spaces and you want to drive through farm fields and see that you can do it if you want to go to the beach you can do that pretty unique in that regard or whether you want to go into a downtown area and hit some artisan shops or you know maybe go to a, a play you know at the Stephen Leacock we they have Disney plays all the time live musicals they're incredible so you can sort of do it all right we're very unique in that regard Dave, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor to sit down with you for the last uh, almost hour and chat to you about yourself, but also the town of Georgina. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate it. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity. And of course, for the uh, the town of Georgina, it's always great to talk to people about it. Perfect. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Cross Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light on the issues affecting municipalities requires both dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help us to continue to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the Cross Border Interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, stay talking.